In science, when we make measurements, we need to reflect a certain degree of uncertainty because our numbers matter. In science, each number represents a measurement. So we want to be certain that when we write a number down, it represents a measure that we either have taken or could take in a lab if we ever want someone to repeat our experiment. When we measure, we're limited by the tools that we use. There's no way for me to cut a piece of pie exactly in half. So when I talk about something being half of a pie, I should reflect in that number some degree of estimation. There's no such thing as a perfect measurement. There's always a limit. For example, when I'm using a ruler, I'm limited to the smallest measurement on that ruler. In this case, each line represents 0.1 centimeters. So if I'm going to measure the length of that green arrow, I need to estimate one space beyond the 0.1 centimeter to show that in fact my green arrow extends past one line but doesn't quite reach the next. And because in this case the arrow extends beyond the fifth small line but not quite to the sixth, I could estimate that it's somewhere between 0.5 and 0.6, 0.57 centimeters. Now maybe you looked at that and you thought 0.58, that's okay, or 0.56, again not a problem, as long as you make sure that your measurement expresses one estimated digit, in my case the seventh. So what's the right measure? Well. A lot of cases are going to depend on what the measuring device we use will allow us to actually record. In this case, my ruler again has tenths of centimeters. So which of these four measurements will reflect the length of the tan piece of paper? Well, let's see, 12 centimeters? We know it's beyond 12 and not quite to 13. We've got the ability to estimate even farther because I have tenths of centimeters marked on this ruler. So 12.7. It does look like it's right, on, right at that line. I'm pretty tempted to write 12.7. But remember, since I have tenths marked, I have to estimate one space beyond it. Now I'm pretty convinced it's right at that seven line. So I'll write 12.70. The zero is an estimate. I'm pretty convinced, but there is a limit to my ruler. I'm not certain it's any more correct than that. Maybe I'm really convinced, and I'm tempted to throw an extra zero on there, 12.700 centimeters as if each zero gives me some sort of extra believability. Well, it's tempting. It's done a lot in marketing and advertising and sales, but it isn't done in science. In science, one estimated decimal place is good enough. When we're using a graduated cylinder, we've got one milliliter markings to work with in most cases. I'm going to estimate then to the nearest 0.1 milliliter. And using a graduated cylinder, I'm going to measure from the meniscus. That's the center of the liquid curve. In most of the cases, that curve is going to be like water, where the water curves up at the edges. If we needed to measure something like mercury, where the curve would be the other way, and our meniscus were to be at the top of that curve, we'd use a graduated cylinder designed for that sort of fluid. In this case, it's above the ninth line, so I know it's past nine milliliters. Not exactly to the tenth, so I'm going to guess 9.7 milliliters. Now I use the word guess. I'm very confident about the 9. The 7, that's the estimated part. Every science measurement has an estimate. It's not a blind guess. I'm pretty certain I'm more than halfway past the, uh, the 9 to 10 milliliter range there. The 7 is an estimate, though. And because that last digit is an estimate, anytime someone wants to repeat my work, all they have to do is have a graduated cylinder that has milliliter markings and they have to fill it to what they think the seven will be. Here's a photograph of a graduated cylinder and we're left trying to take a measurement with it. We can see if 52 milliliters is correct. Well looking at the meniscus right here I'm above the 52 point so that's probably not the best bet. It, it may seem easiest to work with that, but it's not the most correct. How about 53? Well, if I look here at the edge, that's right on the 53. That seems tempting. But again, 53.0 reflects the edge, not the center of the meniscus. Yes, it has the right number of decibels, but it doesn't show the center of the curve. 52.8? Well, that has the right number of digits, estimating a tenth place since I have every milliliter marked. 
and it reflects that I'm not quite at the 53.0. I like that measurement pretty well. So I'm going to say that one's our best bet. Here's another example. This is from an old triple beam balance. You guys are lucky. You have digital balances to work with in our lab. But you may have seen scales like this in a doctor's office or a weight room. In this case, the slider point right here indicates where our measurement is being made. Seven grams, is that good enough? No. Our measurement, I have the ability to measure with tenths. So 7.1, 7.2, 7.3 grams. So I know that seven is not enough. 7.5? Well, I do have every tenth of a gram marked on this, but I'm a little past the 7.5. 7.59? Well, I know I'm past the 7.5. The nine is kind of a guess, but that's okay. Remember, we want an estimate, an intelligent guess on our last digit. What if I'm really, really close to 7.60? Can I say 7.598? Not really. That's adding a guess on top of a guess just because more digits seems better. It's not better though. The best bet is 7.59 grams. Now, uncertainty. Not only does our, our last digit reflect an estimate, but it tells us where we've made that rounding if we add uncertainty. When we report a number, we're going to indicate how uncertain the measuring device will be. In general, we estimate plus or minus half of the smallest measure. For example, if I estimate something to the point one place, like in the case of those, uh, uh, those graduated cylinders, I'm going to need an add an uncertainty that is plus or minus half of that tenth place. So plus or minus 0 0.05. The exception to this is if I measure at two ends, like with a ruler. It seems like we only measure at one end because that's where we're looking when we're trying to read a number. But remember, we line up a zero point at the other end, and we have to make some estimation there as well. So we have a degree of uncertainty at both ends. Just like before, we're still doing plus or minus a half of the smallest measure, but we're doing that twice. So we have plus or minus the smallest measure, the half at each end. So here are some examples that we could look for our uncertainty. With a ruler, I measure something to be 0.57 centimeters. Well, remember, that's plus or minus the smallest digit value. In this case, that's the hundredth place. So I'm going to be plus or minus 0.01. That half of a thousandth place at the front of the ruler, the half of the thousandth place at the back ruler, giving me a, a whole hundredth place uncertainty there. With that same ruler, same sort of uncertainty. Just because my number value is bigger doesn't mean my uncertainty has changed much. With a graduated cylinder, I measure something at 9.7 milliliters. Now, the graduated cylinder only has a measurement at one end, so I estimate an uncertainty of plus or minus 0.05. Because we have the tenth place in our measurement, we estimate 0.05, that half of a hundredth, or pardon me, the half of the thousandth, the 0.05 hundredth there. With a graduated cylinder again, 52.8. It's really only that eighth and the tenth place that I need to determine for my uncertainty of plus or minus 0.05 to show where the rounding occurred. With a digital balance, we measure 7.59 grams. And you may think, well, it's a digital balance. Those things are perfect. Not true. The digital balance is still estimated somewhere between 7.60 and 7.58. So we need to make an estimate of 0.005 plus or minus, to indicate where that rounding has happened. That's how uncertainty works. And every time we record a measurement in our IB chemistry class, we're going to record an uncertainty. We'll talk a little bit more next time about how we use this to make some mathematical calculations, because we've got to account for those numbers in our calculations. One other thing I want to touch on today are IB units. These are how we record derived units in IB sciences. There are some standards that have been agreed upon. One of those standards has to do with volume. For volume measurements, we're not going to use liters or milliliters in our reports. We're going to refer to liters as cubic decimeters from now on. And milliliters will trade for cubic centimeters. 
the two val sets of values are equivalent. Liters equals a cubic decimeter and milliliter equals a cubic centimeter. This allows for some mathematic conversions to go on later when we're trying to derive other units. The other change it will make as we enter IB is eliminating fractions in units. For example, density could be recorded as grams per cubic decimeter. But instead, we're going to write this as grams times decimeters to the negative third. The negative third means the same thing as the decimeters cubed on the bottom of a fraction. But this allows us to eliminate some mathematical error later on within our units. It's a habit that we're going to get into, and it's a standard that we're going to stick with. I hope this has helped with uncertainty. Let me know if you need a little more guidance.